Cosmic knowledge and the future of the human race, not exactly uh, an unambitious topic. <laughs> And um, I must say that, again, like so much of what I've done, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't had encouragement and education from other people. And the key event, this is a big night for me, actually. This night has been in like 25 years in the making. And uh, the beginning was this. My colleagues, Joel Premack and Nancy Abrams, who wrote this book, View from the Center of the Universe. So this book was published in 2006. And what was Sandra Faber thinking back then, 2006? Sandra Faber was having a sort of crisis of confidence, wondering whether or not what she was doing was very important. So I was doing a lot of cosmology, answering where galaxies came from, but I was sort of asking myself, so what? And I was feeling guilty because, you know, astronomy is pretty expensive. And taxpayers, being a member of a public university, uh, taxpayers foot the bill, either federal or state. So is it worth it? And this book and conversations with these two dear people, by the way, this is a fabulously written book. It's some of the most eloquent prose that I've ever read. And I know because I just went back and read parts of it in order to prepare for this talk, so I recommend this book. Well, what their premise is in this book is that every society has something called a centering cosmology. And this does two things. First of all, it says how the people, in quotes, were created, where they came from. So that's kind of a factual story. But the other half is the important half and what their purpose is. So this successful, the centering cosmology, if absorbed, told you what you were supposed to do in that society and why you were important. Now, an interesting thing about historic ancient centering cosmologies is that the heavens nearly always played a central role. And why is that? Because the heavens are big, they're impressive. They are bigger than we are. They're stronger than we are. They can create. We're small. They're big. They're the realm of gods, et cetera, et cetera. And so every one of these cosmologies nearly always cited the role of the heavens. And then something happened, something important. I'm getting this all from their book. Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton rendered these ancient cosmologies obsolete because they subordinated the heavens to science. The heavens could now be understood by scientific law. They were not subject to the realm of gods. They couldn't be made up in a story. We had to understand them using science. Now, we've been at working at that since Copernicus, etc. And science is working well at telling us how the people were created, telling the cosmic story. I'm going to tell you an abbreviated version in a few minutes. But, and this was the key point of their book, the sense of purpose was removed and has never been restored. And as a result, they put forward a story, at least in the West, of a sort of a drifting society, adrift, not knowing what its purpose was. Uh, and um, this has been the source of spiritual malaise for the last 300 years. OK, well, I thought about this. And I think that much of this is true, but I don't quite agree with the last part. Because I think, actually, we have developed a new purpose in the last 300 years. It's called progress. And where does progress come from? Progress, it seems, comes from growth economic growth, ever larger utilization of resources. Growth is like a drug. All you have to do is read the Wall Street Journal to understand that. If you are not growing in the Wall Street Journal, you are falling behind. So the world GDP is growing at 3.5% per year right now. In a human lifetime, 80 years, four decades, that corresponds to a growth of around a factor of 16. Things add up. 
over time, 3.5% per year actually means something. And I submit to you all that we're worried about this. That finally we think maybe Malthus and his prescriptions of limits are finally coming true. Do you think that the Earth can actually produce a factor of 16 times more in the next 80 years? I mean, we're already using half the water. One out of every two water droplets that falls on the land is used before it goes to the ocean. And I could give you many such statistics. 95% of potentially arable land is farmed. Is there another factor of 16? I tend personally to doubt it. I think, at least in your heart of hearts, many of you do too. And I think this is causing fear and anxiety and malaise. And so if there's a problem in our current spiritual situation here, it's not caused by lacking a purpose. It's caused by the fact that our purpose is about to die. And why is it dying? It's because this purpose, which is predicated on endless growth, is disconnected from the real cosmology. What does cosmology do? It tells you how you got here, but it also tells you what the limits are, what the stage is, how big the stage is. The beginning of our cosmology today is planet Earth. And what this eternal um, scenario for growth is telling us is that Earth is finite, and we are ignoring that. And any society that functions in contradiction to the, its cosmological truths is doomed. Now, cosmology presents us with limits, factual cosmology. But it also might present us with possibilities. And I'm going to present two themes in my later talk about um, questions that modern cosmology might be answering that might actually open the door to new possibilities for us. The first question, is Earth safe? Does Earth provide for us a livable future over cosmic time? And why is that important? That's important because it tells us whether or not we have the prospects for a cosmic future as human beings here, a long human feature. The second question I want you to remember is Earth rare. And the answer to that is going to tell us whether or not we are alone or not. And the answer to that has deep ramifications. Both of these do. So there are profound, as we will see, profound moral issues that are raised by the answers to both of these cosmic questions. And one of the things I wanted to tell you today, the, really the highlight of my talk, is that UC Santa Cruz is sensitive to these issues and is now investing something called an Earth Futures Institute that will help humanity answer these questions and respond appropriately to the answers. So I'll be coming back to that. Remember the phrase, moral compass for the future. That's what I think we need to be thinking about. OK, so in my talk today, I promised to tell you about how cosmic knowledge is important for the future of the, ra of the human race. What I'm going to do, first of all, is review the cosmic story very briefly. Try to answer these two questions and tell you what Santa Cruz is doing as part of its construction, its creation of this Earth Futures Institute, and why it can help. So let's start with the cosmic story, 14 billion years in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so the early universe, almost smooth and with density fluctuations about one part in 100,000. If I put this little laser pointer on the surface of the Earth, it's about one part in 100,000 over the Earth's radius. OK, so that's a uh, part in 100,000 is small. Observe the time and the temperature. 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang began, a very small number, and a temperature of 10 to the 27 degrees. Huge numbers, ridiculous numbers. So let's just pause there for a minute. Do we know what we're talking about? 
Can you believe this? All I can say is we deduce the consequences and we, we produce today's universe. So uh, I want to say one more thing about this before moving on. These fluctuations are born out of quantum fluctuations that are infinitesimally small and grew to become galaxies that are 100,000 light years across. I want you to remember that. A quantum fluctuation made galaxies. If there's nothing else you remember from my talk, you should remember that. Because that is the quintessential thing that I will die happy knowing. <laughs> I have learned that, and it's the most interesting fact that I know. Okay. Now, as I say, uh, we reproduce the universe working these conditions forward. And by the way, let me pay homage to Joel and George because it was the three of us who worked out the first version of this theory. So, in a nutshell, there are peaks there, there are places where the density is higher, they draw in matter around it, the valleys lose matter to the peaks, the peaks grow, it's an instability, it's like economics, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. <laughs> and we can make movies of this. So now I'm going to show you, I think you were going to turn out the lights, please. Okay, I want you to turn them out, please. Here's a very wonderful movie. It's a slightly fictional, but um, it gets the idea, okay? So the people who made this movie started with peaks even before the movie began. The peaks are growing. They're drawing matter in. This is supposed to be a region that's going to turn into our galaxy. <coughs> the blue stuff that you see here is hydrogen gas and helium gas coming out of the Big Bang. And the white is stars that form in regions where the gas is dense. We're still in the pretty early universe here, like 10 or 12 billion years ago. And you can see it's pretty exciting. I mean, you know, it's chaotic. These little lumps are running into one another, and they disrupt one another. And if you look closely, what you tend to see here is that a lump, if let, left undisturbed, the gas falls in and makes a rotating disk. But then if two lumps collide, the previously formed stars get disrupted and form a big spherical cloud, which astronomers call a spheroid. And then gas continues to fall in and remakes the disk. So we can see now entering the later stages of the universe, the universe is expanding, so the collisions are less frequent. And in the late stages of galaxy evolution, they're less disturbed. So at this point, after a lot of collisions, we're left with a spheroidal, centrally concentrated sphere of stars. And the last gas that fell in is now making stars in a disk. Isn't that nice? OK. All right. Now, how do we know that that is true? Because that picture of spheroids together with disks reproduces the galaxies that we can actually see. So here's a selection of galaxies imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope, moving from objects with big spheroids and small disks through to, at the end of the sequence, galaxies with large disks. And now we can look at some objects which fortuitously are seen edge on. And we can see very visibly that there are flattened rotating disks embedded in these spherical clouds of stars. So I could spend much more time here convincing you that this model of galaxy formation actually matches the universe, but then I wouldn't be able to give the rest of the talk. So I'm going to leave it at that, but leave you with a thought here that now we see that our own Milky Way was formed via that process. This is a wide angle lens, which sort of distorts the plane of the galaxy, but you can see quite clearly the center, there's a big cloud of stars, there's a flat disk that's rotating uh, with interstellar gas and dust. The dust is in silhouette. All right, now we've made galaxies. That was the great achievement of Joel and George and myself. We have to turn to other astronomers to explain stars. 
Stars form from dense clouds of gas inside galaxies. For example, this nearby galaxy in the local group, M33, it has a cloud of stars imaged with Hubble here. And this is kind of the standard morphology. Here's the little cluster of stars that's forming. They're sending out a lot of energetic heat and light, and they're kind of evacuating a cavity and lighting up the dust from which they formed. So this is a typical birth cloud. And our galaxy is full of these. Here's the young cluster. Ultraviolet light is coming out in all directions, illuminating this cloud. Bent Westerland made a survey of these, and this is Westerland 2. Fine. Now, how are we going to get uh, individual stars and planets? Fortunately, there's a uh, laboratory right near called Orion. And this is not a star. This is the Orion Nebula, which is one of those glowing gas clouds. Let's enlarge it with Hubble. Miraculous Hubble has almost endless resolution. Keep going. OK. And finally, we get in to a point where we can see some detail. And it's very convenient that there's a glowing gas cloud behind this, so we can see things silhouetted in front of it. This is a star forming. This is a star also forming a little bit further along. We can see an age sequence here. Here are a bunch of young ones. And their material hasn't all collapsed yet. They're still distended. And after a while, if we wait a while, all the material falls in. It's a mixture of gas and dust. The dust absorbs the light. You see it in silhouette. Here's the little baby star. And this is a disk of uh, a protosolar nebula, a rotating disk of gas and dust. And we know it's flattened and rotating because we were blessed with one really flat edge-on system in Orion. We can see it quite clearly. And this is quite large. This is 17 times as large as Pluto's orbit. Here's the little star peeking up above and below the dust. Before I leave this topic, I really want you to remember the dust, too. Okay? <laughs> Quantum fluctuations and dust. Dust is made in stellar atmospheres. It comes out in supernova explosions, expanding atmospheres. And it's picked up in protosolar nebula. And it's sticky. And so, first of all, the grains, the individual grains, they're about the size of cigarette smoke. Very small, the size of a wavelength of light. They get together, they make globs. The globs get bigger, and then finally they get really large and large enough to accumulate and pull in via gravity the surrounding gas in the solar nebula. And so interstellar dust is the ingredients of rocky planets. If we don't have stars making dust, we will not have any planets in the universe. And I love this picture because it sort of sums that up. It really brings the galaxy down to Earth. Here's all these rocks in the foreground, and here's where they came from. Okay. Really nice. All right, so gosh, I think I did it. In about 10 minutes, I told you where Earth came from. Now, what we'd like to know is we'd like to know if Earth is rare or common. Remember, that's one of the questions that I posed in the beginning. So let's consider that. What is the evidence telling us? There's one point of view that says that Earths are common, and it was put forward by Frank Drake. Frank Drake was a famous radio astronomer back at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Virginia, West Virginia. But he actually was at Santa Cruz for a while. He was dean of physical sciences there, and he went on to help found the SETI Institute. And this is his famous equation, the Drake equation the number of detectable intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. And the number you get is proportional to the number of stars, and then there are a bunch of other factors that you have to put in. And it turns out that there are six factors in the Drake equation. But an alternative point of view is a rare Earth point of view, and it has its own equation, the rare Earth equation. And it also starts with a number of stars, but now, voila, it has 10 factors. 
Now, if you put in about a tenth for all of the Drake equation factors, you wind up with a lot of planets, a lot of habitable planets in the galaxy. But there are four more factors here, and if each one is one-tenth, then your chances are only one ten thousandths as large of getting, right? So it's very, very clear that understanding these factors is critical, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this. One of these factors here is whether you have a moon like our moon. You'd never think about that, would you? That you need a moon to have an Earth-like planet? We'll come back to that. Now, the very first thing that everybody knows is that you have to be in the habitable zone. So what is the habitable zone? That's the place where liquid water exists on the surface of the planet. Not too close to the star, not too far from the star, just right, sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. Well, the first thing you need to know is that not all habitable zones are okay. Every star has a habitable zone like this, but you might be a massive star and rather bright, in which case your star lifetime is too short to make life as we know it. On the other hand, you might be really low mass, your habitable zone is extremely small, and planets might be tidally locked to the star. What do I mean by tidally locked? It means that one face of the planet always faces the star. Can you imagine what would happen to Earth's climate if the same side of Earth always faced the sun? It would make a planet completely unlike what we know today. Okay, So very key that we have a good short rotation period for Earth as we know it. Well, the next thing you have to worry about is the planet itself, planet properties. You know that some planets are too big, they're too gassy, some are too small. Here's Mars. What's wrong with Mars? Mainly, it's, it couldn't hold on to its atmosphere. It didn't have enough gravity to do that, and so it lost its atmosphere. I don't know if you've ever looked at images of Mars. You can see Grand Canyon on Mars, running water, delta, everything, you know, for the first... Several hundred million years, Mars had lots of water. No more. All right, so now we've got an Earth-mass planet, but that's not the whole story. You need plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is convection cells that move from the core to the crust. And they are constantly recirculating the material of the crust. They move the continents around the crust dives down to get recycled inside this semi-molten material. This, we now know, this is a pretty new re uh, realization, is essential for a stable climate. Because if you get excess CO2 up here and your planet begins to warm, that's okay because the CO2 from weathering goes into the rocks and then gets subducted back down into the Earth. This is the Earth's thermostat. And it seems pretty clear that if you don't have plate tectonics, you're not going to have a stable climate over billions of years. Also, when the crust goes down here, some of it scrapes up and it builds a continent. I don't know if you know that in the early years there weren't any continents, maybe just island chains. All of these continents that we can see were built by plate tectonics over time, so tectonics gives you land. What does it take? It, you need water in order to lubricate the rocks that make convection possible. Venus lost its water and doesn't have plate tectonics. So Earth is different. So we're building up a lot of requirements here. The last thing I want to say about plate tectonics is that it cools the outer core, cre creates convection in here, which actually drives something called a magnetic dynamo, and it's the magnetic dynamo that generates our magnetic field. Now I'm going to start in my talk to show you some pictures of important people at Santa Cruz who have helped to generate this lore of knowledge. This is Gary Glatzmeyer, who was the world expert on simulating the Earth's magnetic field and the first person to show that it could actually naturally reverse its polarity over time. So here's one of Gary's models. This is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, and this is the dynamo generating it in here. So let's do a little crude graphic sleight of hand. 
What does this do? Okay, it sits in the solar wind and it deflects the solar wind. And if you don't have this magnetic field and the solar wind comes out, you're going to lose your atmosphere. And that's part of the problem with Mars. So, plate tectonics, geodyna, geodynamo, we're building up all the requirements that it takes to make a planet that we know. And I'll, I'll close with this one, but this is by no means the last in the list. Do we need a moon to make a habitable planet, our potentially crucial moon? How did the moon form? The best theory for it now is that a Mars-sized planet crashed into the Earth and created an awful lot of debris, out of which the moon condensed. A giant impact with something that is called Theia, 30 million years after the Earth formed. This set the Earth's axis of 23 degrees, which gives us nice seasons. And then that was protected by the moon from further perturbations by Jupiter. The soon scene was therefore set for moderate seasons, which some people think have been a wonderful, gentle forcing function for biological evolution. And finally, it gives us a short day. Otherwise, we might tidally lock with the sun and have a day that's um, 365 days long. We have a nice short day, and this is, makes photosynthesis possible. All right, so I'll stop there. You're getting the idea that, in fact, a lot of factors went into the existence of Earth as we know it. What about other Earths? Are we seeing evidence for them? Actually, Lick Observatory, along with a place in Switzerland, pioneered the, the technique of finding planets using radio velocity shifts, the so-called Doppler shift. And most of the first generation of extrasolar planets were found at Lick Observatory. For many years, Lick was the leader. Now, these first planets were massive hot Jupiters grazing the surface of their sun, like a period of four hours. <laughs> Amazing. Why? Because they were massive and close to their sun, and that caused a really big velocity perturbation. They were easy to find with the radial velocity method. Since then, we've had the Kepler satellite, which has found most of the planets that we know today. And let me uh, pay uh, my respects here to Natalie Bataha, our latest astronomy faculty member at Santa Cruz. She was the project scientist for Kepler. So the radial velocity, mostly Lick and Keck, those are the red points. And transits are mostly Kepler. Kepler. A transit is when the planet goes in front of the star, dims the light of the star, and you can see the dim. So this is the collection of planets as we know today, just about 3,000 or so. And you can see they come in families. And by the way, we don't know why they come in families yet. This is a mystery. So we can't claim to know if there are lots of other Earths out there until we can explain this diagram. And we've not yet done so yet. Another thing you note is that here are the solar system planets. And there seems to be sort of a discovery line in this diagram. We don't see much discovered here. And that's because they're harder to detect. They're either smaller or with longer periods. And it's going to be some time before we've discovered those planets, but there are techniques in process that will do so. The last thing I want to point out is, oh, that's interesting. OK. Uh, I've lost my little planets here. Um, Venus and Mars would sit right here. What I'm pointing out with this is that not everything that sits right down here is habitable. So there have been widely cited papers saying that there are a lot of planets down here. The first thing you notice is that in order to come to that conclusion, they have to extrapolate from practically no data. <laughs> and even if they found a lot of planets, we can see planets down there that aren't habitable. And so. Here are conclusions about whether Earth is rare today. The frank answer is we don't know how many Earth mass planets are in the habitable zone. And not all planets in the zone are habitable 
And therefore, my conclusion is that Earth-like planets might, in fact, be very rare. And that is my emotional reply, but I don't know that it's a fact. We can ask Natalie after my talk, how soon are we going to know the answer to this? And I think, <laughs> I think that she will be optimistic that within a few decades, we're going to answer this question. So remember, the rare Earth was one of my cosmic questions, and I have to tell you today that I don't know the answer, but we will soon, so that's important. My second cosmic question was, is Earth safe? And I'm going to run through the next six slides like bing, 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 because they all say the same thing, that either this problem on the slide is not a problem, or Yes, there's a problem, but we probably have at least 100 million years to go. So let me zoom through them. Solar warming, not a problem. Supernova explosion, no. <laughs> Comet, asteroid impact, we're working on that, not a, not, not a difficulty. Ice ages, um, not very serious, okay? Not, not, not enough to destroy habitability. Supervolcanoes, they are the problem. They are the biggest unpredictable threat to life, and uh, it's kind of nice that the Earth is cooling off. Maybe we'll have fewer of them in the future. But again, if we look at past frequencies, it's something like 100 million years to a loss of habitability. And we'd probably be able to predict that with some accuracy before it happens. Okay, so lessons from cosmology. What are they? First lesson, Earth is going to provide a livable home for at least 100 million years, maybe longer. And therefore, we have been given the precious gift of cosmic time, eons of it. Really remarkable. Lesson two, have I invoked any miracles? No. We got here according to the laws of physics. There are no miracles, and therefore, we're not going to be rescued by any miracles. We are in charge. And we are the first generation of human beings to hold Earth's future in our hands, this long future, 100 million years. And we're the first generation of human beings to have this knowledge, to know these things. This brings up some new and thorny moral issues. I'll go through them kind of quickly because it's sort of obvious. Obligations to future generations, custodial responsibility for Earth. What if Earth is a dime a dozen? What if Earth is rare? Okay. Should we be thinking about galactic planetary parks for planets of special worth? Is Earth the Yosemite of the galaxy? <laughs> I'm, not ki I'm not kidding about that. Is there, now I'm really digging deep, is there any intrinsic value in the future activities of humankind? Does our species have a destiny? And if the answer is yes, will the human moral code adjust to deal with these new questions? If you're a religious person, can you adjust? If you are like me, a person who believes that her moral code comes from my genetic DNA, Hmm, might be even harder to adjust. How can I tune my own DNA? So, I'm pleased to announce that Santa Cruz has decided to establish an Earth Futures Institute to help humankind grapple with these issues. There are other Futures Institutes in the world. Why would this one be unique? First of all, it's it's the only such institute in the University of California. In my opinion, the University of California is a sleeping giant, which, or maybe actually an ostrich with its head in the sand. <laughs> and it is not adjusting to these changes in circumstance with anything like the alacrity it should be showing. So Santa Cruz will lead the way. We also would like to engage in a multi-campus partnership with UC Riverside, which 
Thank God there's another campus with similar interests in the whole university system. My partner, Bara Mobasher, is here and came all the way up from Riverside to hear this talk. Well, in addition, there are two aspects of our Futures Institute concept that are completely different. The first is the focus on the long term. Not just the long term, sure, we're going to think about short term problems, but up to a million years. And I believe, from trying this out on people, that the long term focus can completely change the nature of the discussion. Why? Because if you talk to somebody about the next hundred years, what are they worried about? They're worried about their grandchildren. Will their grandchildren be able to breathe air? Will they have more food than your grandchildren, right? But a million years is 40,000 generations. And at that level, we lose all of our vested interests, our emotional baggage. We can think about Earth and our progeny in the most abstract way. We can think about what should Earth be doing in the universe in a way that we cannot if we're focused on the next hundred years. So I think that this is a very valuable component of our plan. And finally, this really makes us different. We believe that the ethics of the future are absolutely essential to addressing these problems. And, you know, nobody ever talks about the ethics of the future. They don't talk in, you know, saving the rainforests, the uh, uh, plastic bags in the ocean. Why are we doing this? Why should we sacrifice our consumption today unless we have some long-term reason to do so? And unless we feel that long-term commitment, we will not curtail our consumption today. As a species, we need to have this very deep discussion about where we are going, if we're going. And if we can, if we can forge a consensus on this, then there is hope. And I'm coming back to the centering cosmology that Joel and Nancy told us was so important. This is what we have to work on, the purpose part. All right, so I've told you that we're now going to start an Earth Futures Institute at Santa Cruz, and we have ongoing faculty projects that can serve as the foundation for larger and more ambitious efforts. So I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you about five of those, and each one of these has a really fabulous faculty member here. This is Jim Zakos. He's in our Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. And Jim, I really have to spend some time here. This, this is one of the most interesting things that is going on in geophysics today. So what Jim has done, he's an expert in studying how climate responds to CO2 and, in addition, how ocean organisms respond to CO2 in the atmosphere, which then goes into the ocean. So many people are worrying about putting more CO2 into the atmosphere and trying to predict what kind of warming that will produce. But Jim has done something much cleverer. He has looked into the past climate record and found a particular event that is 56 million years ago, from which you can do two things. You can figure out what the global warming was at that time. It was a warming event, 10 degrees. 18, 10 degrees centigrade, 18 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot, in other words. And by analyzing the shells of organisms in the ocean, he can tell you how much CO2 went into the atmosphere. So he is the only person who's actually done an experiment based in fact that says, if you put so much uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, you will get a warming of 18 degrees. And the interesting point here is he and his colleague, by the way, his colleague is Ridgeway from UC Riverside. Okay, the two of them are working together. Okay, so they t collectively figured out that this warming event was caused by a dump of 5,000 gigatons of CO2. 
into the atmosphere. They have no idea where it came from, okay? Don't know. The interesting point is now projections are showing that we're going to burn something like 10,000 gigatons in the next 100 years. Now, this event took about several tens of thousands of years. We're going to do this in 100 years. So as I'm talking to people here, uh, they say, forget about this killing global warming. Global warming is happening. And what we need to do is model it more accurately in order to cope with it. And so my first expanded project is to build the first comprehensive Earth system simulator that integrates not only atmosphere, ocean, land, and biosphere, but also human inputs. It would be very useful in the near term to figure out how we're going to cope with this pulse of CO2. But in addition, it can be used, once we develop it, to figure out how many intelligent beings could, can the Earth support over a million-year time frame. That's, I submit to you, what we need to know. That's what the cosmic information is that we need to figure out. You know, Supposing it's like 2,000. Or supposing we're living in tents. Do we care? Do we want to preserve the Earth for something that insignificant? We need to know what we're headed for and what is realistically possible, assuming we're staying here on Earth for a good fraction of time. This business of sustainability for 100 years, forget it. It's cosmic sustainability that's really important. So this Earth Systems mod um, Simulator is something that we need to start building. It's not a project, really. It's a decade-long campaign to make something that is reliable. We need to start now. That's my first project. Second one revolves around David Hausler, who's here this evening, very accomplished faculty member at Santa Cruz, he led the team that assembled the first human genome, and he and his team created the UCSC Genome Browser, which is the leading browser that gives you long reads, and that's what you need for high accuracy. He's got a lot of projects, irons in the fire, but here is, I think, the project that should build on his expertise and that of his team. He suggested this. Predict the rate of human genetic evolution once human germline engineering becomes widespread. You know, if somebody changes the genetic makeup of my thumb, who cares, right? But if I'm a young person and they change the genetic makeup of my eggs and I have children, that change goes into the inheritance of the entire human race. Supposing we modeled this and we found that this was fast, like, you know, a few decades before really uh, consequential changes are going to be made. We have to understand this time scale. And as you know, of course, there was the recent event in China when somebody actually did try to edit the germline of two people who are now living, okay? <laughs> that change is now part of our new inheritance. Okay, that's project number two. Project number three builds on the expertise of Anthony Aguirre, also here this evening, one of our most creative thinkers at UC Santa Cruz. He founded the Future of Life Institute and another very interesting Futures Institute as well. Here's the Scientific Advisory Board, Alan Guth, Morgan Freeman, Alan Alda. Uh, I mean, you couldn't find... a uh, bunch of more luminous luminaries than these. The Future of Life Institute deals with many of the problems of uh, growing technological sim simulation. I think they're most famous at the moment for um, creating the Asilomar principles for the beneficial use of artificial intelligence to which thousands of people, including many scientists in California, has signed up. The project, I think, that would take this expertise further is to develop a similar principles for genetic engineering. I've just expressed the need for that. 
All right, well, I showed you this list of new and thorny moral issues. I just want to remind you that there are many moral issues. And I think, personally, for me, one of the most interesting of these moral issues is where do we get our morals? So this is a great research problem for the University of California to figure out why people think what they think and how malleable are those views, because we might need to change our views going forward. So another wonderful plus that we have here at Santa Cruz is something called the Center for Public Philosophy. John Ellis is the director. He's with us tonight. And this is a wonderful organization that is trying to foster civilized public discussion of difficult questions. They're pioneering something called the Ethics Bowl, which is supposed to replace debate with a more reasoned approach to ethical questions. So the Center for Public Philosophy can be another center for us to bring our research questions into the public sphere and initiate public discussion. Because if we don't involve the public and appeal to their moral sense, we won't make any changes. The last project I want to point to is um, our new Astrobiology Institute, which is headed by Natalie again. And David Diemer is uh, another professor interested in the origins of life. This is his new book, Assembling Life, which I'm almost all the way through. I'm proud to say that. And um, if we put these two people together, three projects come to mind that are very important. First of all, the properties of exoplanets, that's what Natalie is working on. What kinds of planets are habitable? This is where David comes in, because if he can tell us how life formed, he can tell us what kinds of planets could have hosted that event. And once we know those two things, we can put these two things together, we can really answer this question, which I posed in the beginning, how rare are habitable planets? Why is that important? Well, I think the answer matters either way. Supposing we find that Earth is very rare. I tend to believe that our ethics basically springs from the motivation to protect complexity, to, complex, to, to, to protect rarity. I'll just give you an example. Why I spoke of Yosemite. Why do we protect Yosemite? How would you feel if Yosemite was, was paved over with an airport? You'd feel a sense of loss, wouldn't you? How do you feel when somebody dies? You feel a sense of loss because that was a complex, creative individual and they don't exist anymore. Any time complexity, which reflects potential, disappears from our world, we mourn that. And I, I believe that this is one of the absolutely most fundamental impetuses for our ethical system. And therefore, I think if we show that Earth is really rare, it will have an impact and we will want to protect it. And that's where our support for environmental work and so on will come from. On the other hand, supposing we find that the Earth is not rare, then I think we will want to grow. We will want to expand. We will want to explore. We will want to extend the strategy that we've used for the last 300 years, knowing that we can do so, maybe not right now, but after we've perfected space travel. And in a million years, we could. See, that's another benefit of a million years. Things can be completely different in a million years. All right, so images are so powerful. They provoke our emotions. I'm going to end with this one. And this is an image of Saturn. From a different vantage point, this is the image taken by the Cassini spacecraft that went around behind the planet and looked back towards the sun. So we see the rings there and forward scattering. It's incredibly beautiful. But I just want to leave you uh, with the thought that this is not just a picture 
of Saturn. It's also a picture of Earth. Okay? So that's what Earth looks like from Saturn. So I'm very interested now. I'm going to look to the future. How will people look at this picture 100 years from now? Will they think, eh, tiny, insignificant, not important? Or will they think, as I do, that the most complex and interesting things going on in the universe are happening there? And if that's true, and we let that all sort of escape our grasp, uh, I think that would be a great tragedy for the human race. So I'm very pleased to tell you about the Earth Futures Institute starting at Santa Cruz. You're going to hear a lot more from us. We want your feedback. We want to know if this talk has resonated with you and how we convince other people if it has. Thank you.